Good morning. I'm Tim, one of the pastors here, and can we just uh, go before the Lord in a word of prayer? Thank you, Lord Jesus, for your great love for us. We've sung about it. We've uh, seen it exemplified in your work on the cross and the grace that you have showered on us. Thank you for this special day when we uh, honor family, honor mothers, and above all, we honor you as we worship to get together today. Teach us, uh, make us stronger as families, make us stronger as the family of God as we follow you. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. If you have a Bible, I invite you to turn with me to Colossians chapter 3. For our scripture today, Colossians 3, starting in verse 17. And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Wives, submit to your husbands, as is fitting in the Lord. Husbands, love your wives, and do not be harsh with them. Children, obey your parents in everything, for this pleases the Lord. Fathers, do not embitter your children, or they will become discouraged. Hear the reading of the word. So after a collision class Wednesday night, one of our ministry team members came up to me and said, uh, we're not going to be here this week, uh, but good luck. And I'm like, huh? He said, I read ahead. Uh, my wife and I won't be here. We're visiting somebody for family, but good luck with that topic on Mother's Day. Wives, submit to your husbands. Thank you very much. As I have tried to teach other younger pastors, some, uh, done some seminars on Preaching, uh, one of the rules of preaching is to create tension because that makes people want to listen. So I suspect when I read the scripture, I've created some tension. So you'll probably listen to me for at least a few minutes. In defense of this passage, I will remind you that have been here for a while. We've been working through the book of Colossians now since the 1st of January. And we are, we are committed to verse-by-verse -verse exposition. And if we're going to stay in Colossians, then... As we're thinking through, as I'm praying through the passages, this is the best one that fits Mother's Day without completely picking a different passage. So that's one disclaimer. The other disclaimer is that Mother's Day is a minefield, in case you haven't ever experienced that. And it's because we have so many different experiences and expectations, um, whether moms or families. Um, some wish they could see their mom because he's either gone or she's so far away. Um, some wish they could be a mom, or they're mourning a loss of a child. Some are wondering where their mom is. They don't even know who she is. Uh, others, uh, maybe Mother's Day is an ongoing reminder of the feud you have with your mother or your kids. And some moms, probably, this is not a great day because it's a constant low-grade reminder of failures or a sense of failure, not living up. A completely different group of people are here or watching or will watch later today or watch later this week are those who are not in a traditional family. And you find the whole topic a little bit of a distraction, at best uncomfortable at worst. And I want to just remind you that we as a church, desire that everybody enjoy an authentic, real relationship with Jesus Christ as a part of the greater family of God. And we're going to be thinking this year about being the church. That's our theme for the coming year. And the point is, your church family is bigger than your nuclear, your biological family. And it's, in the scheme, grand scheme of things, more important than your biological family. So we should be that kind of family and think of church as that kind of family. So with that said, this passage moves from general guidelines for the family of God, which we've seen over the last three weeks, verses 5 to 17, to now specific guidelines for the nitty-gritty of earthly household relationships. 
This passage gives us guidance as to what does it really look like to do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus in everyday relationships. The relationships where most of us live at one level. So how do you do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus in family relationships? And there are three pairs that would have, of, of groups that would have been in a typical first century household. There would have been husbands and wives, parents and children, and masters and slaves. We'll get to that topic. That's another thorny topic next week. But the point is, as we may hear some of these words and think, well, that's, well, that's really kind of traditional, to understand in the first century this was extremely countercultural. And in some ways, it still is today, as you think about our culture. The point is, in Christ-centered households, number one, four relationships, are, four guidelines are given. The person is stated, the command is given, and the second phrase gives some sort of motive or explanation of how that command should work. And in Christ-centered households, wives submit to their husbands. This is a theological principle that within equal relationships there is still some functional subordination or headship. For example, 1 Corinthians 11.3, the Bible says, The head of every man is Christ, the head of the woman is man, and the head of Christ is God. Now, we know, if you know your theology, we believe in one God eternally existing in three equally divine persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. But in that equality, Christ the Son is subordinate to God the Father. But they're equal in person. So you can be equal and still have some functional subordination. That's what we're talking about here. Now, the way, there are several ways that this first command is countercultural. We're going to understand that first of all, we have to understand first century Greek Roman households. They're way broader than what we think of as a household today. And in the first century, the household stabilized everything about the culture, uh, about a nation. And so it was way broader than a nuclear family. Think, for example, extended family. Think of all your in-laws, all of your cousins, aunts and uncles. Think of somehow all of you living together, in the, not in the same house, the same compound. And all the people who work for you or with you in your, in your business or your family farm, that's household. It's way broader than we think of today. And in the context of the first century, the head of the household was head. 99 or more percent of the time, it was a man. Once in a while, the head of household was a woman. Lydia, in Acts 16, is the head of the household for whatever reason. But the majority of the times, it's the man. And he's the husband, he's the father, he's the master. So this, these commands are countercultural. The first one especially, for, for three different reasons. Number one, he talks to the wives directly. In the first century, all you would talk to would be the head. And the head would tell everybody else what to do. He is treating, very counterculturally in the first century, he is treating women as responsible moral agents that he can talk directly with instead of going through the man. That's countercultural. Uh, but second, the idea of submit, which we often think of as some sort of uh, coercive concept, if you study it in, in the Greek language, the, the point is you can't coerce somebody to submit. By definition, you can't force submission. Submission, when you go through all the word studies on the word, the best way to summarize it is the voluntary subordination of oneself under someone or something voluntarily, under their authority or direction. It's, as one commentator says, this is an appeal to free and responsible people. You choose because you're, you have dignity, you have responsibility, you choose to subordinate yourself to someone or something, in this case, the husband. So, um, give an example from uh, our marriage this service, I can get away with probably saying things I probably won't in the second service, since Carol's not here. But, and not, not that we have a perfect marriage, because any, <laughs> any of you that know us, uh, kids, who also aren't here, uh, uh, staff, or, or people who have been in small groups, know that my wife and I are constantly bickering. And you laugh at us, and we laugh at each other. Sometimes there's a little bit of grain to truth to it, you know. 
But we t I talked about this with my wife yesterday. It, 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 am I right in saying this? It, in, and her consensus was yes. In our marriage, I rarely, if ever, have pulled out the submit card. Wives submit. Haven't had to do that. Maybe it's more of a credit to her than to me. But the point is, it's a voluntary relationship of give and take, and we talk together, we work things out. Uh, one commentator says in this, that the whole New Testament teaching on the nature of oneness in Christ, which we're going to see in a minute, along with Ephesians 5, the example of the husband and his wife, shows that there's a trend towards sharing of dimensions of marriage. So there's a give and take of mutual respect. Once in a while, you may have to say, okay, one of us has got to take the lead here, so it's the guy. It's countercultural because he talks directly to women. He talks he, because of the nature of submission. And the third reason it's countercultural is that he adds this condition as is fitting in the Lord. Now, if you, again, it, it, the reason we even have to have this here is because when people believed in Jesus, they at one sense, became um, an obliteration of all distinctions. We saw that in verse three here, uh, verse uh, eleven, chapter three. Here, there is no Greek or Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave or free, but Christ is all and is in all. And Galatians three twenty eight says a similar thing. There is no Jew or Greek. There is no slave nor free. There is no male nor female. So there was a danger that the first century believers would start to perceive that means we wipe out all distinctions between individuals and roles. It, it is not the purpose, it was not the purpose of Christianity in the first century to blow up all of social structures. The purpose was to reform them to be Christ-centered. So you would never have, there were all sorts of household codes like this in ancient rules about how to manage a house. You would never have a phrase in there as is fitting in the Lord. It is now a Christianized household code. So this means, so, so what are the conditions when wives don't submit, or when we get a little bit later, when children shouldn't obey? Well, in this passage, it doesn't consider anything like that because he's talking to believers. And, and everything that's come before this, verses 5 to 11, is assumed you, you, you're living this out. You're living out the virtues, you're putting to death earthly vices, you're putting on virtues of love, and if you're doing that, this won't be a big deal. But, but the condition there is, as is fitting in the Lord, so there may be circumstances when this isn't in the Lord, or isn't something the Lord would have you do, where you may have to negotiate more strongly. And this is also assuming that the husband is loving his wife like Christ loves the church, which we're going to get to in a second. So the question then is, in this kind of Christian relationship, wives, what does it mean to submit to your husband? Second description of how to do verse 17, whatever you do, whether word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, is husbands love their wives in Christ-centered households. Now, that should be kind of a duh statement. But again, in ancient household codes, and there were lots of them, there was never anything about the husband having to love his wife. Having to love his wife. All of the household codes had to do with making sure the household is run in an efficient manner. Make sure the, there's order, because that's the building block for all of society. So why does he emphasize both of these statements. Why does he emphasize wives submit and husbands love your wives? Because I think both of these address underlying sin nature reactions in this nitty-gritty relationship of life. Wives, it's human nature to chafe under the headship of a husband. And husbands, it's human nature to abuse your authority. And what keeps it in bounds is the command, love. If you study love in the Greek, this is the agape ao word. It is more than sex, sexual affection, sexual love. It's more than affection. It's more than liking somebody. That's a different word. 
This word means a, a commitment. Love is a commitment to, as one commentator says, unceasing care and loving, and loving service for her entire well-being. This kind of love is modeled by Jesus. It's talked about in one of the famous marriage passages in the kind of parallel letter, Ephesians. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. We sang about that. Show me how to love like you've loved me. That's how Christ loved us. And that means that this kind of love is countercultural because it's sacrificial. That was countercultural then. It certainly is countercultural now. Because most of us, by nature, um, serve self first. This kind of love serves others first and sacrifices our preferences for the person whom we love. Notice it's also countercultural in that this points to Christ. In fact, marriage points to Christ. That's the bigger theme of the whole reason for marriage uh, throughout the Bible. Trevin Wax, in his book, This Is Our Time, is talking about one section on marriage. He's, and he says, the mystery, uh, mar marriage is a covenant that enables deeper, richer love to flourish, even in the difficult times of life, because it's a commitment, it's a sacrifice. And he quotes uh, Jen Pollock Michael, who says, the mystery of marriage isn't its limitless capacity for securing our personal happiness. The mystery of marriage is its witness to the eternal self-sacrificing love of Jesus for his bride, whom he intends to purify and present holy and blameless without spot or wrinkle. As Christians, we have an opportunity to show how marriage points beyond itself. What he's saying here is countercultural then, it's countercultural now. Marriage is not for us. It's to point people to the mystery of God's love for us. So at the end of that passage on marriage in Ephesians 5, he says, this is a profound mystery. We think he's talking about marriage. But he said, I'm talking about Christ and the church. So the entire moral of these four verses is that family relationships are subject to best what best represents the name of Jesus. Husbands, love your wives. And if you want to know how, do what Jesus did. And by the way, it's not resentful or angry. Do not be harsh with them. The root word for harsh there is if you have a sour stomach or you drink bitter water. And it's not her fault. It's the man's fault. Saying, don't let that happen. In love. So there, are, as you can see, there are many countercultural implications. Another one of the countercultural implications of this kind of love, mutual love, is about the sexual relationship. Paul is way ahead of his time in the first century. In 1 Corinthians seven, uh, he talks about how the the woman's body doesn't belong to her. And the man's body doesn't belong to him. It's not just about what you want. It, they belong to each other. In Keller's little book, just got this little free book at a conference I was at a couple months, about a month ago, How to Reach the West Again. He talks about how the church needs to build into itself five uh, elements that were present in the first century church, which made them compelling missionaries. And we need to do that again because we live in a post-Christian world in America. We need to think like missionaries. And one of those five values was they revolutionized the sex ethic. He said, in the Roman world, sex was merely an appetite. Its only purpose was to keep everybody, you know, the social order in place. Married women could not have sex with anyone but their husbands. But men... Even married ones could have sex with any male or female they wanted, as long as it was somebody of less honor and lower class. Christianity's revolutionary teaching detached sex and marriage from the social order and connected it to the cosmic, to God's saving love and redemption. 
God gave himself to us by going to the cross, and we must respond by giving ourselves utterly and exclusively to him and to no other God. This saving love brought about an astonishing union between two radically different beings, God and humans. So if the marriage is to reflect that, sex was not for self-gratification, but for giving one's whole life in a consensual marriage covenant that fostered deep unity across the radical difference of male and female and combined their non-reproducible excellencies. He says later, in our Me Too world, where we have abuse rampant, the Christian view requires sex to always be super consensual, only for people ready to give their whole lives to each other, one and only. Went on to say, this was a high attractive vision of the character of sex and it took enormous power away from men of the upper classes. Christianity was immensely attractive to women in the first century who saw it as an equalizing, empowering religion. Husband, love your wives. And to love your wives as Christ loved the church is completely countercultural. It was, that was then, it still is now. So what does it mean, wives, to submit? What does it mean, husbands, to love your wives as Christ loved the church? Third, if we're going to do whatever we do in the name of the Lord Jesus, in Christ-centered households, children, obey your parents. Now, this is a great Mother's Day sermon. Children, you need to obey your parents. Okay, this is the part that's really good for moms. Uh, by the way, obey is much more absolute than the sort of similar term sub uh, submit or be subject. It's much more absolute. Now, again, this is countercultural in a couple of ways because, number one, again, he talks to kids. He doesn't just talk to the dad. In the first century, he didn't talk to kids. They were the property of the dad. They were just part of the house. And Paul, inspired by God, is saying, children, I'm treating you as responsible people who can listen and who can learn. Obey your parents in everything, for this pleases the Lord. Again, the condition there, this pleases the Lord, is also countercultural because this is not just like any first century household code. There are boundaries, there are guidelines as to what pleases the Lord. And just as we saw that in the husband-wife relationship, you see that here. This is, again, written to Christian families. It doesn't even consider the scenario where a father or mother would tell you something to do that God doesn't want you to do. And if you don't know what that is, read verses 5 to 11 again. There's a great list of things. This is what you're not supposed to do. This is what you're supposed to do. These character traits. And so it doesn't envision a circumstance where a Christian family would have instructions given to kids that violate the will of God. That's a boundary. I think today, as we uh, try to apply it to our own world, it's countercultural a little bit in the opposite way. I think oftentimes we as Americans expect, we sh I mean, we should still expect, we should still expect children to obey. In some ways, uh, the 21st century America has almost made kids too equal. and has uh, treated them as way more responsible and mature as it's possible for anybody to be before 20-something. I don't have time for examples, but I'll give you a couple. We, 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 we let them decide on their own what we should not let them decide on their own yet. I was in my first church, one of the friends a little, a little bit older than I was talking about the whole question of kids drinking. And he was talking about an eighth grade boy. He said, well, I, I think at some point I need to let him decide whether or, not, whether or not he wants to drink. And I'm like, have you lost your mind? 
they're not responsible old enough people yet to make that decision. Uh, what level of activity do you assume your children are mature enough and grown up enough to handle? You think they're mature enough to handle 14-hour days every day? You can't handle that. And how many of us have filled our kids' lives with crazy busyness? And they work longer hours at life in school than they will when they grow up. Even worse, and here's where I'll camp a little bit, is I think we have treated our kids too equal in terms of what they, or how much they use their devices. Unrestricted screen time. Sitting in a pediatric clinic about three years ago with my daughter, a week or so after she gave birth to their second boy, and he had some issues. So I went to the clinic with her while she took him to see the doctor, and I'm watching this slideshow in the waiting room of the pediatric clinic in suburban Chicago, and it had all these guidelines for screen time for kids. It's a pediatric clinic. So they want parents to see it. And it's, I mean, I started to, I took five or six pictures of it. This is good stuff. From a completely secular perspective. It's astonishing what pediatric experts tell you about your screen time. And I, now this is where the Mother's Day sermon is not so great. You're going to feel guilty now. Because you're letting them have too much screen time. The recommended time for a two to five year old is one hour a day. And it should be supervised. And by the way, parents, grandparents, shut off your own phones. Because they're watching you. The um, problems with screen time, this is pediatrics three years ago, the dangers of too much screen time are, quote, obesity, irregular sleep, loss of social skills, and vision impairment. So on Tuesday, I'm having my annual vision exam. Do you know they have a new test now where they measure your tear ducts right under here? They take a picture of it? Because with added screen time, we're seeing people whose tear ducts dry up. And so now every time you go in, they're going to take a picture you can compare this year to last year. And I was talking how my eyes are bothering me with the contact. Sometimes they dry out, especially watching the screen too intensely working on something. And he said, that's what happens. And he said, you would not believe how many parents are letting their kids look at screens for hours. And when you look at screens, you don't blink. He said, I've, I've had parents come in here, sit in the vision exam, doing their exam, and they bring their little toddler in, they sit there in a chair, one or two years old, and they just stare at the phone the whole time, I'm doing their eye exam. They never blink. He said, I've had high school boys, 17 years old, come in with the eyes of 70-year-old men, what they call dry eye syndrome. It's irreversible. You have to take... Eye drops the rest of your life. That's just one consequence of thinking our kids are old enough to manage their screen time. Children, obey your parents. So they're not, they're equal in terms of dignity, they're not equal in terms of maturity. And it's in the Christian household, we have to make sure we understand it. Children, obey your parents. By the way, that whole screen time thing, that's, that's a minor issue compared to some of the other issues that we have yet to see the effects of in modern culture. So parents set the rules, children obey them. Fourth guideline, which may help in terms of implementing, is um, in Christ-centered households, fathers do not irritate their children. They encourage them. This is the only verse where he has two negatives. Fathers, do not embitter your children, or they will become discouraged. Why does he have two negatives? And why does he single out the fathers, not just the parents? Well, of course, the man was ahead. And again, it's, it's countercultural in the sense that in the first century, 
Father was not, would never be expected to listen to anybody tell them what to do with their kids. And now he's saying, no, dads, here's some guidelines. You, you have to listen to me. And I think sometimes today's fathers still have no idea how hard it is, so maybe that's why he singled them out. Then I heard this idea about a pilot survivor show. Six men will be dropped on an island with one van and four kids each for six weeks. Each kid plays two sports and either takes music or dance classes. There's no access to fast food. Each man must take care of his four kids, keep his assigned house clean, correct all homework, complete science projects, cook, do laundry, etc. They only have access to TV when the kids are asleep and all the chores are done. There's only one TV and there's no remote. They must attend weekly parent-teacher conference meetings, clean up after their sick children at 3 in the morning, make an Indian hut model with six toothpicks, a tortilla, and one marker, and get a four-year-old to eat a serving of peas, and the kids will vote them off based on performance. It's really hard to be a parent. And maybe sometimes dads don't realize how hard it is. Maybe that's why he focuses on them. By the way, I use this word intensely. Do not, fathers do not irritate their children because I want you dads to ask your kids if you ever irritate them because I guarantee you they're going to say yes. And then you can decide whether or not it's a legitimate irritation. But talk about it. The word irritate, the way I've translated that's too soft. It's stronger than that. It's do not embitter them. Do not provoke them. It's not just irritation. It's worse. So there are several implications of this. One of these is don't nag. Because nagging is really provoking. It doesn't help anybody. You or your kids. And there's nothing more irritating. Menander, who was a 3rd century B.C., Greek dramatist and author wrote several Greek plays, comedies, said, A father who is always threatening does not receive much reverence. If you're always saying don't do that or if you do that and then you never follow through, it's just a nuisance. You're irritating everybody. Don't make promises or threats you don't intend to keep. If you, st if you don't stop doing it, I'm going to ground you for three months. Really? And when you set natural consequences, follow through. Don't nag. On the other hand, don't expect perfection. They're kids. Pick your battles. The reason I say that is because the second part of this is don't embitter your children or they will become discouraged. The word there is uh, don't cause them to give up, to lose heart. To stop even trying, because whatever they do, they always mess up. Pick your battles. And then be firm. Be consistent. Be an encourager. Menander, that Greek, uh, Greek dramatist, also said, one should correct the child not by hurting him, but by persuading him. Your children are not mature. In our baby dedication prayer, we, we always say something like this, we will be careful not to bruise these tender children with harsh words, quick judgments, or cruel criticisms. They're not adults. Love them, and don't irritate them, encourage them. Find a way to build them up and encourage them. So I would challenge you families, if your kids are old enough, talk about this. Um, moms and dads, um, we, we'd like you, we, we think you need to work on this obedience part. Here's where you need to get better at obeying. And kids, tell mom and dad, where is this really not working? How is this actually provoking us instead of helping us? How can we do a better job of setting guidelines that are positive? So this is the list. Wives, submit to your husbands. Husbands, love your wives. Children, obey your parents. Fathers, do not embitter your children. Why do we do this? Because whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus. Family relationships are directed, they're dominated, controlled, governed, whatever word you want to use. They are governed by what best represents and best serves the Lord Jesus. 
I will paraphrase a saying from Orthodox theologian Alexander Schumann, who said this about marriage. I'll adapt it to marriage and family. A marriage and family which does not constantly crucify its own selfishness and self-sufficiency, which does not die to self, that it may point beyond itself, is not a Christian marriage or family. The only reason we do this is to point people to the name of Jesus. Think about the families that you've known. As I did that, I jotted down half a dozen. I could add more. Families you know, have known where it's obvious that Jesus is Lord. I think of families that I grew up around. I think of families in my first church. I think of my senior pastor's family. who well, Both of them are with the Lord, parents now. I think of families who used to be here, have moved away. I think of families who are still here. I think of some of you. And they model this. Not perfect. Nobody's perfect. But they model this. and You can feel love. You can feel honesty. You can feel open communication. You can feel genuineness. You can, see, you can see grace. And they're hospitable. Other kids want to be there. I want to be there. The concept of family is bigger than our idea of nuclear family. It's, it's, and that's the kind of family we are and we are to be creating. And just as with the church as a whole, verses 5 to 17, these are the guidelines. Families are gui guided by the same standard. Whatever brings honor to the name of the Lord Jesus. God wants us to submit these relationships to the Lordship of Jesus. So, Whatever your choices, whatever your dilemmas this week, whatever relational dynamics you're dealing with, what actions and what attitudes will best represent and serve the name of Jesus and adjust our lives accordingly? Will you pray with me? Father, thank you for being our Savior, for sending to, to, be, to be Lord of our lives and to guide us into how we could be reconciled and be part of your family. Thank you for the church family that you've created through Jesus. Thank you for the way that you transform relationships between people of, of different backgrounds and personalities and styles. Thank you for the way you transform the everyday relationships of households and neighborhoods. And we recognize it isn't easy to love the way you loved us. It isn't easy to live out these everyday relationships in a way that honors you. But I pray that you'd help us to see that vision and to see how we can point people to you because of the way we love each other and live with each other. In Jesus' name we pray.